So welcome. Today's uh, state policy showcase is focused on lead and drinking water um, in schools and child care facilities and the laws in Colorado and Michigan that are designed to help protect kids. Um, as we're going, uh, getting started, uh, please share your organization and uh, which native lands that you're on or just your location. Um, feel free to use the chat box for questions. Uh, we'll have several opportunities throughout the showcase to have you come off mute and just ask a question if you prefer that. Um, otherwise, I can read things in the chat. So who you are, where you're from, uh, let's get to know each other. Just a little brief summary um, about River Network uh, in case you don't know who we are and just have found this uh, through the wild, wild interwebs. Um, River Network is a national organization. We're a nonprofit that connects and strengthens the efforts of over a lot, as you can see from the map, uh, local groups, agencies, tribes, and utilities working for clean water and healthy rivers across the United States. Um, we envision a future of clean and ample water for people in nature. Um, we want to equip caretakers um, to be effective, courageous, and champions for rivers. Uh, we have a water protectors map on our website, rivernetwork.org, that I suggest you check out. Um, and yeah, we're a pretty cool group, I'd say. I've got my colleagues April Engel and Aaron Kanzik here to help me uh, facilitate. So they're the real MVPs. Uh, and we just got off of our somewhat annual, every two years now, uh, conference, River Rally, in uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, last week. So we're a little tired, but we're here, and we're excited uh, that you all are joining us. Um, I kind of want to go over some group agreements. Uh, just be yourself, be authentic, respect our diversity, what we're bringing to the space, the fact that we all have our own lived life experiences, and that you know that might inform our questions and how we interact with each other. Uh, please actively participate. This is not supposed to be just a let's talk at you for an hour. Uh, we can do that, but it's not as fun. Um, take space, make space. If you're asking a lot and other people are trying to, you know, ask stuff too, like make space for them. Um, assume positive intent. That's something we at River Network hold really deeply. Uh, that goes for everyone in the space. You know, make sure that you're coming at it from a perspective of wanting to see the best in each other. So, uh, I am super excited to introduce today's speakers. Uh, we have Alex Simon and Cindy Roper. Uh, Alex is a public health advocate with uh, COPERG. Uh, she has an undergraduate degree from the University of Pennsylvania and a graduate degree from New York University. Alex is an advocate on Colorado-based campaigns to promote a healthier, cleaner, and safer world. So Alex is located out of Colorado, which is also where I am. Um, Sydney is based in Michigan. Uh, she is a senior policy associate at NRDC, the Natural Resources Defense Council. Um, she has an undergraduate degree from Drury University and a graduate degree from the University of Missouri Columbia. Uh, she works to ensure all Michigan residents have access to safe, sufficient, and affordable water um, from the source to the tap. So awesome, awesome people. Super excited to have them on board. Um, and I think we're gonna get started today uh, to go over the agenda with Alex uh, talking about the Colorado lead law, a Q and A opportunity for about five minutes, um, then talk about Michigan with Cindy, Q and A, and then we'll just have a group discussion. Um, so one thing I wanna ask you all that you can put in the chat right now is why, why, why did you come here? <laughs> like, why is lead and drinking water a concern for you? Is it a concern for your children? How do you connect it to this topic? Um, are you working to help protect people from uh, exposure to this contaminant? So feel free to drop that in the chat um, and we'll get started. So let me change my presentation. Got a lot of tabs open here. <laughs> and then... I will pass it to Alex. Awesome. Thanks so much, Shelby. And uh, yeah, just a big thanks to Shelby and the River Network for organizing this event today and NRDC for joining us. Um, it's really great to have an opportunity to talk about this policy that was passed in Colorado. Um, you know, just to get started, um, you know, we talked a little bit about like, how did this law come into effect and what the impetus for Colorado's bill was? And I think, 
to understand that, we got to rewind a couple years um, back. Um, for a long time, we really had very little data about lead in water in Colorado. There had been very little testing done. Um, and even though we suspected that it was prevalent, there just wasn't a lot of information out there. And hence, there wasn't a lot of information to use to propel action. In 2017, the state started a voluntary testing program with some grant money. Um, that was the first time schools could enroll in the program and then get some funds for testing and remediation. Um, only 67 schools in Colorado participated in the program over its three-year period, and 40 of the 67 schools um, had results above the action level, which for this program was 15 parts per billion, um, which as many of you may know is significantly higher than what's recommended by medical professionals like the American Academy of Pediatrics, which recommends a one part per billion threshold. Um, so at the same time, NRDC had been doing a lot of work um, around lead remediation, and they were active in Colorado, really working together with the Colorado People's Alliance and the Plumbers Union Local 3. Um, Shelby, you can move to the next slide. Um, and so this is a um, little excerpt from one of the early fact sheets that they built around the bill. Um, and they really were, it was really NRDC, I think, and COPA who were instrumental in building the coalition to support the bill where COPA got involved and also getting the bill sponsors, including Representative Emily Sirota involved. Um, and they did some stakeholdering and began to build support for the bill here in Colorado. Um, at the same time, we at PERG and our sister organization, Environment Colorado, had released a series of reports called Get the Lead Out. Um, we'll share the link to those uh, later. Um, but they looked at both the amount of data available um, around lead testing in the states and also assigned each state a grade um, based on policies passed in that state around remediation. So we had a few different things. We had some information coming in through Colorado's grant program. We had NRDC organizing. And then we also had some data coming in from PERG about how Colorado compared national to other states. Um, let's see, go ahead and um, go to the next slide, Shelby. So this, for example, is just an example of a map um, that came from one of our previous Get the Let Out reports. And in it, you can see this map shows how much data is available on lead in schools water per state. And Colorado is there in the middle saying they have data from relatively few school districts so far. So since that, that's changed. But um, this is just an example of some of the data that we were working with. Um, so we can go ahead and move on to the next slide. Um, so the champions, again, really around this bill came from NRDC, came from the Colorado People's Alliance, and also significant support from the Plumbers Union, Local Union 3. But there was a big group of supporters that were built and included in the coalition, and here's a list of all of them. In addition to the bill sponsors, Senator Rhonda Fields, Senator Faith Winter, and Representative Emily Sirota. Um, so here, you can go ahead and switch to the next slide. So in terms of driving action on the bill, um, again, the coalition was getting the ball rolling, but in 2021, there was also an ability to pay for filtration and testing from a bunch of new federal resources, including the American Rescue Plan Act, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, and the EPA's Water Infrastructure Improvements for the Nation, the EPA WIN grant program. Um, so these were new sources of federal funding and remediation that schools could now tap into. Um, and additionally, both NRDC and COPERG are part of national networks. Um, and other states were making progress on moving forward with bills. Um, so that helps set a precedent for action here in Colorado. Um, this slide shows an example of some of the advocacy that groups did around the bill. This is a graphic from a social media toolkit developed by COPA um, to help generate su uh, support for the bill in the 2022 legislative session. Um, you know, coalition members had a lot of talks with the state water control, water quality control division, um, and it took a little while to work with them to get them to come around to understand that there really was a problem and that this was something that needed to be addressed. Um, advocates also, you know, testified at hearings and met with different legislators to really talk about the problem, help them understand the data available and understand the solutions, particularly the funding resources that would be available um, if they move forward. Um, so some of the keys to getting this bill successfully adopted, um, there were a few things that we really, that ended up changing between the initial bill and what ended up being passed. The original bill required schools and child, uh, child care centers to install filter drinking water fountains and point of use filters 
in certain situations rather than the test and chase or test and fix model that was ultimately adopted. So the first bill really sought to do prevention at every tap by having a filter first strategy. Um, it also included kindergarten through 12 and all child care centers. Um, that said, as the bill moved forward, there were complications around fiscal notes, questions about enforcement. The state felt very strongly that they wanted a test and fix model, even though we as advocates um, were advocated strongly for having a prevention at every tap model, knowing that that was really the best way to fully protect kids and also would ultimately likely be less expensive. However, the bill came quite close to dying in committee. Um, Representative Emily Sirota really stood up and wanted to find a path forward that would allow this bill to pass. The major compromises that um, resulted from that were that only um, grades up to five were covered. So most child care centers, preschools, elementary schools were covered. Um, there's a second tranche of funding that's available, if available, could cover testing in middle schools, but we haven't gotten to that point yet. Um, and no funding available for high schools. And again, the major change between um, providing filters um, versus testing and remediation. So the bill ended up using a test and fix model um, for remediation. So those were the two major compromises and ultimately NRDC dropped their support for the bill because it didn't meet those standards in those areas. Um, in terms of impacts the bill has had so far, um, the test and fix data, about 600,000 children in Colorado um, are impacted under the program. So the bill that was ultimately passed um, had a five part per billion standard and again included all the most child care centers, preschools, elementary schools impacted 4,500 facilities in the program. Um, they collected 53,000 samples for the state lab to test. And the data that came back showed that about 7% of the fixtures tested were above the five part per billion action level. Um, and that equated to 3,700 fixtures across 965 facilities. Um, of all of those fixtures, um, when the state last collected this data, they showed that 600 of them have fully completed the remediation process and the rest of the locations are still in some type of progress um, towards final corrective actions. So we have a lot of data now, and what we're what we see is a lot of schools still working um, to make those remediations. Um, let's see, we can move on to the next slide. Um, so we just want to talk a little bit about um, shortcomings of the bill or ways we thought the bill could be improved. Um, again, our goal is to provide lead-free drinking water to all students um, and prevention at every tap. We know testing can be unreliable, still likely to leave lead in the water. Um, and we really wanna see, we'd like to see a policy that moves towards filtering all drinking water and away from the current test and chase model. We'd like to see all ages protected. Again, our end goal is ensuring that all children are fully protected and that includes those in middle and high school. Um, and so next steps should include funding to cover prevention in these grades um, as well as the child care and elementary schools. And, and additionally, one other next step that Colorado could take is having no additional lead in water. So until 2014, um, faucets, fountains, plumbing fixtures could contain as much as 8% lead. Um, in 2014, the federal law was updated and dropped that allowable limit down to 0.25%. However, tests have shown that that is still not sufficient and that lead will still continue to leach into the water at that rate. Um, and so we've seen some states, namely, well, we've seen California um, take a step beyond to protect kids even further. Um, they had a bill that adopted even stricter standards for lead and plumbing fixtures um, that used something called the Q standard that had a much smaller allowable limit for lead, basically less than one part per billion. So those are a few areas that um, we thought you know, were shortcomings or areas that the bill or policy could be improved on as we move forward. Um, in terms of taking action locally, um, we have a toolkit. So I work together. I'm the Colorado-based policy person. Um, here together with me is John Rumpler, who's our um, Director of Clean Water Policy from Environment America. Um, and so we work together. I do local policy here in Colorado, and he helps develop some resources um, that everyone nationwide 
can take advantage of. Shelby will share these links. Um, we have a Get the Let Out toolkit that helps provide some facts on the problem, sources on solutions, um, funding resources, has sample materials, links to resources. So it's a really great resource for anyone who's interested in taking action locally. Um, and, you know, for example, like our report in Michigan, um, and I know Cindy's going to talk a lot more about Michigan, but, you know, a couple of years ago, Michigan had a failing grade in our Get the Lead Out report around lead policy. Um, and, you know, that helped create a story to legislators and the media about why Michigan was failing and how they can work to change a state grade. And in the next version of the report, you know, following Michigan's successful laws, we'll expect to see, you know, Michigan's grade improve dramatically. So I think there's a story there. If you're working on lead and drinking water in your state, you can motivate your state legislators to get an A, you know, from our grades. Um, last slide. So because next week I am uh, moving on from this position and relocating to Connecticut. Um, so unfortunately I won't be your point of contact going forward, but I have John here with me today and he can help answer any questions that you might have about national policy. Here's his contact information. Here in Colorado, you're welcome to reach out to our executive director, Danny Katz. And again, here's a whole list of resources that Shelby can um, share with you that get the let out toolkit. Um, we have a map of lead in schools drinking water, the grading the states information, information where all the data is for Colorado, the text and fix water for kids website, um, the annual report that has some summary data um, and summary information about the data collected so far in Colorado, and some sample um, activist materials like a comment letter that we drafted for the EPA. Um, so thanks so much for the opportunity to talk about Colorado's law, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Alex. I'll pass it to April, and I'll uh, pin you both. Yeah, so if anybody has questions for Alex, feel free to come off mute, or if you have a question, you can put it in the chat. And it looks like, Alex, we have one question in the chat. Um, was a cost, a cost analysis performed comparing the installation of preemptive lead filler filters versus test and fix? That's a great question. You know, I know that the state did a cost analysis in coming up with the fiscal note for the, for the bill and that that was somewhat of a point of contention. Um, but I don't know exactly what specifically, just to be totally upfront, went into that cost analysis behind the scenes. I would imagine that it was something to that effect, which would allow them to push back and say, no, this isn't financially feasible for us. But I just was not closely enough involved with that part of the process to say definitively that, yes, they did that. Thanks, Alex. Other questions for Alex? May I, may I, this is Karen, may I ask another question? Sure. Um, one thing about lead testing is it can be hit or miss. So is only one test performed at a site or are multiple tests performed during different phases or activity in a day? Thanks, Karen. That's a good question. Um, under Colorado's current test and fix program, only one test is required for each fixture. Um, and I agree with you, that's a major shortcoming because lead levels can ebb and flow within a water source. It can be contaminated from a variety of parts within the building or plumbing fixture. And it is an yeah. unreliable way of really determining the lead level in that fixture. Um, but in this program, the fixtures are only tested once and multiple testing is only done on fixtures that have an initial test result over the five part per billion threshold. Um, so they'll get multiple textures tests done or the, a second test done. And then based on that, they have sort of a remediation path that they can follow, but it is generally only one test per fixture. Um, wow, can I, can I ask a follow up? So let's say they did find one with the problem and then they went back and did the second testing and it fell below that level. So would that, would they then walk away and say it's okay? That's a 
Great question. Um, I do think that they they need to do, you know, I would need to follow up and see what their what their plan for remediation is if it comes back the second time under the threshold. Sure, sure. I'm just asking, just asking. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's a really good question. And I'm not sure whether the second test, they they have a bunch of data, but I'm not quite sure, to be honest, whether the second test is sufficient for them to, to stop the testing or whether they could do one more set of tests. John, are you, are you familiar? No, I'm just, I, I just think it reinforces your first point that, you know, that this is just another reason why test and fix is not the right way to go. You know, there's all kinds of ways to game the system between doing one test and then another test and whatever, and the inherent unreliability of testing. So, um, you know, that's why we, we, we wanted Colorado to do something more like what Michigan is going to do that you're going to hear about from Cindy. But, you know, we feel like this was at least a, a good incremental step in the right direction in Colorado, which had no law whatsoever. Um, so, you know, but, but, you know, we're going to hear more about the gold standard in a minute. And there's and Alex, there's another question um, in the chat that um, is asking about lead and copper percentages recorded um, over the legal limit via a, a, an independent testing lab. And curious if 0. 0.3 over the legal limit is high enough percentage to receive funding for further testing or a new filtration system. I I don't I do not know the answer to that question. I'm just going to be upfront. Yeah, um, John, are you familiar with the with what that threshold is? Um, sorry, I was un unfortunately I was trying to answer a separate question in the chat. Um, threshold for what? Um, the 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 lead and copper percentages. Um, over, I guess the like the Safe Drinking Water Act limits. I'm not so. It says legal limit via an independent testing lab. There's a, um, there's, um, testing is showing as based on what I'm seeing in the chat or the question. It says lead and copper percentages recorded look to be over 0.3 over the legal limit via our independent testing lab. Is this high enough percentage to receive funding for further testing or a new filtration system? Um, well, the the way the the way the Colorado law works is it sets a five part per billion limit on lead. So that's the that's the trigger for remediation and compliance for Colorado schools. Okay. Um, and then, you know, it's different federally, which we can talk about if there's time later. Okay. And yeah, then Jessica, just the I see you have your your hand raised too. I was just going to ask, you know, once the schools are notified that they're above that limit, do is the remediation, they just need to change out the fixture or do they have to figure out if the lead is in the pipes? They have like a table of remediation solutions, sort of like a flow chart um, that you can look at in the legislative report actually has the flow chart of different solutions. And it varies depending on where the fixture is and what it's doing. So like, for example, if it's a water fountain, it has to be replaced. But if it's a classroom faucet, it's they can, there's just a different variety of remediation solutions that are offered to them. So it can kind of vary depending on the fixture. Okay, thanks. All right, and Alex, thank you so much for that great overview and answering the questions. There's also some questions in the chat that are being asked and some responses there. So I'll point you to the chat as well for some good discussion there. But um, I'm going to go ahead and um, turn it now over to Cindy to tell us about um, the the state policy um, in Michigan. So Cindy, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much. And um, again, thanks for the opportunity to be here today and also um, Alex for that presentation around Colorado. And I do think a number of the questions in the chat are beyond Colorado and they weren't their own um, sort of opportunity to 
to respond um, in more detail. But as far as Michigan is concerned, we have so I have some slides. I know Shelby's probably trying to get those pulled up, and um, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. In part because we've been so busy working to get the Michigan um, laws on the books and then on the implementation of the laws that we haven't really talked to groups outside of Michigan about what's happened in the state. So this is a great opportunity to start doing that. That's a little bit, um, I already have my title. Um, I've been working on uh, water and drinking water related issues for 35 years. I know it's impossible to imagine, right? But, um, and then I saw someone who's here from Rhode Island. That's actually where I got started was in Rhode Island and I've been in Michigan for the past 30 years. So again, appreciate the opportunity. Um, next slide, please. So um, I wanted to start by, and I don't know, the animation, the scrolling is happening without my having set that. So uh, these are the groups that were really part of the Michigan Filter First campaign team. And um, there are individuals listed at the bottom. So it gives you an idea of um, who all was involved, but organizationally you can see these are groups that played um, some role with the campaign and a lot of these groups participated and still join our monthly filter first calls that have been going on for about four years. The groups that are in teal and then sort of highlighted there are the organizations that really drove the campaign and, and kept all of the other groups posted at every step of the way. So just wanted to share that and if we could um, move forward again, another slide. Okay, I wanted to also flag that the Michigan section of the American Water Works Association supported the filter first legislation. And if anyone wants to talk about why they did that, I'd be happy to talk about it. But I think it was really important to know that um, for a lot of other states to know that the water utilities understood the importance of this legislation in terms of protecting kids. So that was, um, wanted to just throw that on the screen while we were at it. Next slide, please. So as we've already discussed, lead can be found throughout schools and child care centers in you know, various components I've listed here, pipes, fittings, solder fixtures, and other. Um, prior to 2014, again, many of you might know this, but lead, the, these components contain, contain up to 8% lead. That number dropped in 2014, but they can also can, still contain 0.25% uh, lead. And unless you're ripping out the entire school, which we do not recommend at this point, and I'll say why, you are reintroducing lead into the school, into the water every time you think you're fixing the problem. And so we have data to show that uh, that reintroduced lead can be a problem for drinking water. So the question that was asked previously about what does remediation entail is a really important one. Uh, we were able to, um, you know, get lawmakers who were originally thinking that we should go gut the schools and get all of the lead, um, you know, lines, galvanize everything out of the building, rather than doing filter first, that that would not, that would still reintroduce lead and it would be far more costly than anything that we would have to do with the filter first legislation. So just wanted to make sure we all were on, on that, uh, you know, knew about that piece of um, the post-2014 uh, lead content. Buildings, of course, can be served by lead and galvanized service lines. However, um, to one of the questions that was asked, oftentimes the service lines that go into schools, at least, I can't say this for all child care centers, but those that go into schools are oftentimes bigger than those that would be made from lead. However, Denver, I believe I'm was on a call with them a couple of years ago, and I think they said that they found up to four inch diameter lead um, service lines, which is much larger than what you will typically hear. So um, we want to make sure that those service lines are replaced. But we also know that typically the source of lead in schools is going to be coming from the inside plumbing. There are other sources of lead like uh, pre-1988 water coolers or lead lined. Um, and so those exist in some of our older schools as well. So another source of lead. And then the irregular water use um, in schools reduces the effectiveness of corrosion cold control treatment. Um, lead release, we've already talked about how lead release is unpredictable. And I can't over, overstate that 
problem because you can test one fixture one day and there'll be no lead and you can test it the next day and you'll find lead. And so it's really important to note that. And then finally, uh, the part about, you know, the Safe Drinking Water Act has 16 references to lead free. And each of those lead free references are to this 0.25% lead. So they are not lead free. And if you were going to purchase your own fixtures, fittings, et cetera, just be, be advised that the pet where we need to work on changing that. It's something that is on our list of things to do is to make sure lead free actually means lead free. So again, that's just a little bit of background about why we ended up going the direction that we did in Michigan. Um, next slide, please. So we all know there's no safe level of lead in drinking water. This group doesn't need more information about that. But the bottom point about action levels that allow for any amount of lead in drinking water are not health protective. Um, that's just a really important point. And I think we were getting at that a few minutes ago about how, um, you know, whatever, there is no national standard for lead in drinking water. We have action levels. There's no enforceable, you know, maximum contaminant level that would be called. We just have what are called action levels. And action levels for lead in drinking water are basically system-wide. And I'm not going to get into the 90th percentile, but I think it's really important to note that system-wide averages of uh, possible lead levels are very different than actually finding an outlet that has lead at any level coming out of it, that there it's a very specific place where people are consuming um, water. Next slide, please. So um, yes, test and chase, chase pro approaches are costly and misleading. And I we did a cost analysis in Michigan and I'm going to share a link to that. But that was one of the first things we did. Although I know that doing the right thing is um, from a health perspective should uh, you know be a good enough reason alone. But we also were working in a majority um, conservative legislature for the first stretch of time while we were working on these bills. And so it was really important for us, for our strategy to show the cost effectiveness of these devices. So what the filter first law does, which I'm sure you can deduce, is to immediately protect kids by requiring the installation of lead removing filters. Then the testing is after filtration. And that's the thing that even some of our eventual closest allies took them a few times to like really get their heads around. Where we started in Michigan was with a bunch of test and chase bills. A lot of bills out there. In the aftermath of Flint, there were many, many lawmakers who wanted to like make sure that we were tackling every possible source of lead in drinking water. And so we were able to get our legislature to pivot away from that approach and in the direction of you know, going with filter first. And I also want to acknowledge, it's really important to not acknowledge that the laws are actually based on something happening in Washington, D.C. It's not a statewide um, policy, but it is in, this, in Washington, D.C. And it, they're also based on the NRDC's model law. We were in 2019 able to um, write a model law. I will put a link in the chat here in just a minute. But um, based on that model law, um, we were able to adapt it for Michigan and, and to make that um, work. So let me put that over here in the chat really fast. I have a bunch of links I'm going to try to share with you before we're finished here today. Um, next slide, please. Oh, sorry, something's going on. Um, so these are the, if you want to jot down, those are the public acts that were passed in Michigan, but I also have the links pulled up so you can actually um, access the, um, the final, like as it stands in Michigan law. They require schools and child care centers to complete drinking water management plans. So again, every facility has to draft its own plan of where they need to have drinking water fountains, um, where they need to put filtered water stations. And in Michigan, it's a rate, and in many states, it's a ratio of one to 100, like building occupants, so students and educators, that's how many um, units would be needed in the school. Child care centers, um, the deadline for completing those plans in both schools and child care centers is January 24th of 2025, and child care centers have to have filtered water by um, October 
sports of 2025. And then schools have to have filters on all designated, and I'm clear, I'm being very specific, designated um, drinking water uh, outlets by the end of the 25-26 school year. And then the sampling again comes after filtration. And um, we can talk more about that in just a minute. I'm going to put a few more links. And again, I apologize for this, but um, I will get to the questions in just a second. But here are some links that might be helpful. Um, the first one is from Education Week. It was an article that was written like highlighting the new, the cheaper approach, the new approach that actually puts a barrier in place. Michigan Environmental Council did a little piece with some background on the work in Michigan. And then um, the uh, blog about Michigan adopting filter first protections. So as I think some of you know, New York state was the first state to, that had mandatory lead in school drinking water testing. And so um, we, along with some of the other New York groups did an analysis of the New York data and thank you, New York. That's all I have to say is because once you look at the sampling results from New York, you will see that if you look for lead, you're going to find it. We also found in Indiana, did a voluntary sampling program. So that's closer to home for us in Michigan and maybe felt a little more real to lawmakers. If you look for lead, you're going to find it. So um, just, just want to note that. And then the final link that I put in this chat um, was around the cost estimate. So that's where we went in and you can see all of our assumptions for what we did on the cost analysis of, um, and we did this as what we called an open source tool so that anyone who had feedback or critiques or anything could tell us. We weren't trying to say this is the definitive answer because we were building it as we went. And so that's where the cost um, model came from. So um, next slide. I'm not sure how many, if I have another one, sorry about that. That's it. Okay, great. So I'm going to dive in just very quickly to some of those specific questions that I was supposed to answer. And, um, I'm, but I'm going to start with where we are now. So we got the bills through. Um, how we did that was really developing, building strong bipartisan support. We ended up having a, a significant majority in both the House and the Senate and in, in Michigan right now, nothing is happening in a bipartisan way, but there was overwhelming bipartisan so support for these bills. That took us four years to build and can tell you the story along the way, but I won't of all of the steps that went into that, but strong coalition, building strong bipartisan support. Also, we had agency support, in particular, um, uh, our, the woman who was heading up the 3T program, she flagged for me in 2020 that there was a problem with the 3T's funding because as we started working with her on the filter first approach, she indicated that um, she couldn't use the federal dollars for um, implementing filter first. So we worked on an amendment in 2021 to the Safe Drinking Water Act. And some of you might know this, that um, language now allows for remediation with the three T's dollar, uh, dollars. And so I call it the Holly Golke Amendment because it was really Holly, our um, drinking, our three T's person telling me that she couldn't touch that money and use it to implement it, that we were able to like get that through and um, there we are. So I see some questions about funding. We scored $50 million from the Republican majority legislature in March of 2022 to implement filter first. That was significant. Um, we are now working for additional funding. Um, that is a primary focus for us right now to secure additional funding because we set up a fund that will um, be used to basically install filtered water stations. Filters, uh, replacement filters can be funded through this as well as sampling. And so 50 million is a huge down payment, but what happened from the time our cost estimate was done until the time the bills passed, two things. They added private schools and they also added all childcare centers were eligible for funding. We originally had it for childcare centers only serving um, community, low income communities. And so they added all of the other. So we are also working, and I think John is familiar with this on federal action um, with the lead and copper rule, but also 
We're working on other federal um, strategies and vehicles for securing the, these protections at the federal level. Um, and I have other things that are in here, but I'd rather stop with the limited time we have less, left and answer questions if that's okay. Unless, um, Shelby, you want me to kind of keep going with the, um, some of the prompts that you provided us. No, that's okay. I think there's lots of good questions in the chat, so I'll pass it to Erin to help facilitate. Great, thank you. Yeah, thank you all. I'm trying to keep track of these as they're coming in. Cindy, you've got lots of good questions um, coming your way and or Alex, you might answer some of them too. Um, one of them is just, I think, more more broadly beyond Michigan, just a question around, is there an, a national map that shows lead risks by houses built in certain era eras um, based by based on child care centers or schools? Um, just wondering if there's publicly available data that people can look at to understand maybe like their specific risks in different parts of the country. Do y'all so have anything to well, are we talking about at homes as well as at schools, as well as at child care centers? I want to make sure because I'm not looking at that question right now. Yeah, it's it's asking about um, houses, child care centers, and okay. or schools. So right. you could ad address all or one of those depending. Yeah. So in I'm going to start with Michigan. In Michigan, our lead and copper rule um, is the strongest in the country. We adopted in 2018 um, in the aftermath of Flint. And we have been, had an inventory requirement since 2018 um, in terms of learn, uh, discovering what the composition of the service lines are that you know, deliver water to homes. But even in Michigan, where we have been at it for a longer time, the ability to actually access all of that data is discretionary at the community water system level. So they are not necessarily all showing on a map which homes are served by lead service lines. In the city of Benton Harbor, where um, NRDC was very active in the petition that led to the replacement of all of the lead service lines in Benton Harbor, there is a very good map that you can go to and see exactly at, at that community level. But it, it, it is hit or miss in most other communities. And I think as part of the federal lead and copper rule, there's an effort, right? They have an inventory requirement now in all states. And through that, I think there will be better inventories and worse inventories, uh, depending on how much verification is done of the service lines in each water system. And then the question of whether or not they will be putting up maps. So I spent a lot of time on that one. Um, for childcare centers and schools, I'll just say, um, no, <laughs> there is not a map because in many instances, these have not been investigated yet. And so there's not a comprehensive map um, for those facilities. And then in Michigan, I should clarify that our child care centers are not in home daycare. Just to be clear, our the definition of child care center in Michigan is not in home daycare. However, we do have a requirement that all lead service lines at homes in Michigan be replaced um, in our case, at this time, it's by 2041. Um, but again, that may speed up with the federal um, rule if it comes out with a faster timeline. Uh, does that answer that question or did I leave anything out? I think that that is good for now and we'll share some additional uh, resources, I think, after this, especially around like at the national level, what the current improvements for the lead and copper rule status are. There's a question from Sue, Cindy, on um, how are the filters at drinking water fountains maintained and monitored? Is it by the school site staff or other, or other people going in and, and monitoring and making sure those are working properly? It is at the school uh, staff level. So one of the things I forgot to put in the chat is the one I just loaded. Uh, we have been working um, with the state agency on their guidance for implementing the filter first laws. And so there are guidance documents. I would say just as will be the case in every state, um, figuring out enforcement mechanisms is going to be a challenge. However, what we ended up doing was to set it so that um, parents could enforce at the school level 
but that the, the guidance, so the responsibility of the law, breaking the law is a big problem. And so we have, as we move forward with implementation, there will be a lot of work to make sure that the information is getting to parents about, you know, whether or not the school is doing the proper, you know, installation from the start, as well as the maintenance and, um, you know, the post filtration sampling. Uh, okay, anything else on that? I think that is good. And then the next question is, um, was there an equity analysis on how these new laws might impact smaller um, community-based childcare facilities? And is there any technical capacity offered free of cost to them to help them meet the requirements? Um, so yeah, impacts yep. in terms of cost. So as I stated, our original bills were really only setting aside money for those um, community-based child care facilities that were serving low-income um, neighborhoods and residents. And, and where it ended up is that all child care facilities in the state are eligible for funding. And then as far as technical assistance is concerned, in the chat, the guidance documents there are guidance documents and trainings for child care facilities as well as for schools included in those. Um, so, you know, again, the, the equity analysis portion of that was originally designed to really ensure that those facilities were the ones that were being prioritized in terms of funding, but now it's open to all of those facilities. And I don't know if there are more, there was a follow-up to that or not. Um, I don't think so for now. I'm just going to try to squeeze in one more for you, then we're going to open up for the general uh, discussion with you all. Thank you all for putting in so many great questions. Um, there is one other question around uh, if you have any experiences of schools going from their own well with hard water that protected or coated school pipes to more aggressive treated water that might remove the calcium coating creating more pipe erosion and lead leaching. That entire piece, so the, the schools, if I'm following this correctly, so those would be um, non-transient community water systems, like standalone schools that have their own water system. And so much of what is being described here would be regulated by our state agency in terms of any, if I understand, um, like a source switch um, going from their own well with hard water uh, to more aggressive treatment that might remove, like that is all with the regulatory agency. And these filter first laws are really designed to address whatever is coming into the school, whatever is flowing through the pipes in the building when it comes to lead content, these have to be certified for lead, that the, the filters are addressing that. Okay, thank you, Cindy. And Sue, if you have any other follow up with that as we open up, feel free to chime in and I'll hand it back to you, Shelby. Awesome. Thank you so, so much. Um, let's see. If I know what I'm doing. <laughs> All right, now I can see everyone again. Um, I'm just going to drop some questions in the chat for the group as a whole. Um, I think some kind of key questions are what's happening in your state? Um, are you working with any coalitions? You know, how, how would, based on what you've heard today, like how would you build something? Is this kind of the direction you'd want to go in with lead removal? Um, I think it's really interesting to have this kind of specific focus on schools and childcare facilities because it's a very kind of like concrete fix thing of like, okay, here we can see the outcome, you know, like let's try to fix this specifically. Um, yes, I will send a follow-up email. Erin, thank you for responding uh, for all the great resources that our speakers have shared. So uh, don't be shy, feel free to come off mute. Um, Sydney, Alex, if you have any other thoughts or takeaways, also feel free to speak up. Yeah, Ashley. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, I was just gonna say, I'm in Washington state, so I really appreciate you guys sharing like all of your multiple years of knowledge and organizing because 
I work across a lot of different arenas and I would just say a lot of this is really siloed, like you were saying, depending on the community or what sector you're in, whether you're a childcare or a school community-based organization, or if you're in higher education and an academic providing reports to the government. But I think something that I was just going to share is it's, this just helps me demystify like ways that I think are doable instead of me trying to figure it out like by myself with a couple like organizers or youth leaders that are concerned about this because we've seen lead in some of our areas here in Washington. Um, we've found some technical capacity building, but I think, so I'm just like wondering if anybody has advice around like genuine coalition building, especially in like larger regions where like our watersheds are complicated and connected to each other. Yeah, that's a great question, Ashley. Anybody have any thoughts um, for network folks, any resources that come to mind? Aaron. <laughs> oh, I just want to say that's a great, juicy, and complicated question um, around coalition building. And yeah, I no pressure on Cindy and Alex, but I know that you all shared uh, that you had like a wide range of uh, groups and individuals involved in your coalitions. And Cindy, you kind of noted there was, in your case, a core group of people. And then, you know, there's maybe different tiers and levels of engagement. So maybe just giving some examples of like, different ways in which coalitions could be built and how to build that trust between groups that may be new to interacting with each other? Yes, and the reason I'm hesitating, and I think, Erin, you said it right, that complicated, every state is complicated in its own set of ways, and those dynamics are really tricky. So I'm hesitant to weigh in um, without the Washington state like expertise um, but, and, and I don't know the specifics of the group that you're referring to, but I would be happy if you're interested in having an offline conversation so that I can better understand some of those nuances. I, I mean, coalition work is a huge part of what I've done all of my professional life. And there is definitely the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I think in terms of you know, trust building, like I'll just use one on the lead front that was complicated and tricky. And we may have some folks on this call who have experience with this. But originally when a lot of the lead and drinking water issues came up, groups that were working, and I know there are some healthy home groups on here that were working on like healthy homes that have been fighting so long and so hard on the lead um, paint, soil, dust issues and saw this as like competition for very limited resources. So it took some very deliberate conversations and engagement to ensure that those kind of issues were overcome. But again, I don't know your exact situation and what the challenges are. So I'm not um, wanting to necessarily provide additional insights at this time, but would be happy to talk more about it offline if you'd like. Thanks for that insight, Cindy. Yeah, that is, it's a tricky question. And I'd say just really broadly, um, some of the things I think that have been successful or, or helped create success are um, setting up some ground rules and expectations for interacting, similar to how Shelby did at the beginning of this webinar, just making sure, even though some of that stuff seems like it should be obvious or implied, it's sometimes not. And I think just coming up front and setting those expectations at the beginning of a meeting, reiterating them every time you start, that can just really help remind people of the tone. Um, another thing I found is with coalitions, some of them have been formed a long time ago and are kind of like bumbling along, doing very unspecified work. And sometimes um, I think it can really help a coalition, whether it's one that you want to spearhead or join to have a really specific focus. Um, and, you know, if a coalition is working on like water quality, but they are not working on submitting a community response to the November 4th deadline, you know, maybe there's a room, you know, for a coalition to work. I think it works best when there's a specific target or goal that everyone can be working towards and, and not just sort of a, a vague idea or issue that people are working on. And um, I also think whenever it's possible to meet in person, especially relationships that have been um, like I've come into coalitions where there's been a lot of 
previous contention between groups. And it can be a little awkward, especially like I wasn't necessarily part of those conversations. And um, setting up an in-person coffee, a time to chat with an individual face-to-face -face whenever that's possible. I know Washington's a huge state, so that's not always easy. But I found that just to be a helpful way to potentially overcome past tensions or um, past miscommunications that might continue to taint ongoing productive conversation. Yeah. All right. There's a couple hands raised. Um, I, yeah, there's a couple people in the comments that have left contact information. So I want to flag that for anybody who's interested. I'm also going to put links for our online community and the training evaluation. I will note that I need to add this session to the training evaluation, uh, but please uh, feel free to fill that out. Um, but if you can stay on, I'm going to let Sue go and then John because they have their hand raised. But as a whole, thank you all so, so much. It's a great conversation. Thank you, Ashley, for your question. I think it's really thought provoking. And I know from my own experience with coalitions, like it can be in and out, up and down, really depends on the group and who steps up as, you know, a leader in that space. So, all right, Sue, go for it. Yeah, a little bit of an answer to um, oh, sorry. I don't think we can hear you. No, still can't. Do you want to put it in the chat? Oh, <laughs> it's okay. I see your comment. Yeah. Uh, John? Yeah, sure. I, um, I guess, you know, one... Just to segue from the question that we just had previously to the comment I wanted to make, one way I think about coalitions is I always think of like, what do I have to offer? You know, what am I bringing to the table that might be helpful um, and start there? I think our Get the Let Out report has been really useful. It's really great to be able to say to state legislators, like your grade, your state now has a failing grade or only getting a D. Um, that was some of the early press in Michigan um, when we released our report um, showing that Michigan was failing. And then when this awesome law that, you know, Cindy and others led the fight for passed, some of the press coverage was the governor and some of their officials touting that our report would change Michigan's grade from an F to an A. So, you know, all of you out there, feel free to use our report, take it and run with it. Shame your state legislators into protecting kids' water. Yeah. Great. Yeah. I'm all for, for calling out states. Um, yeah. Okay. I think that about wraps us up. Uh, I'll send a follow-up email with all these awesome resources. Um, thank you to Alex and Cindy. Y'all are awesome. Uh, thank you, John, for your contributions and Aaron and April for helping me make this happen. Uh, there's a lot when it comes to facilitating Zoom meetings, a lot of, a lot of moving parts. So thank you all so, so much and have a great rest of your week. Thanks so. all. Thank you. Thank you.